Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Adventures in Machine Learning. I'm one of your hosts, Michael Burke, and I do data engineering and ML at Databricks. And I'm joined by my co-host, Ben Wilson. Uh, I write code at Databricks. <laughs> Each one of these is going to change every episode. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> Um, so today we are speaking with Artem Korin, and he is currently the chief product officer and co-founder at Assembly AI. And their main product is ML that transcribes meetings and generates insights. So think next time you're on Zoom, if you have Assembly AI turned on, it'll automatically generate to-do lists, meeting summaries, potential project lists, that type of thing. So Artem, what inspired you to found Assembly? Hello guys, I'm really excited to be on this um, podcast with you. Um, so uh, my background is in technology management, product management, and management consulting, a lot of it. Uh, and when I was doing management consulting, there was technology that was making its way into every facet of the workflow, uh, but it stopped short of actually participating or understanding the conversation in meetings. And when you're doing management consulting, meetings is what drives uh, the progress, is, it's what drives results. So your, uh, your meetings are your uh, all, all day long. And um, when I met with my co-founder in uh, 2019, and we were thinking about um, potential products and applications, new technologies that are coming up that could solve some problems, uh, it was a very... You know, it was, a, it was a very obvious thing that uh, what the team discusses during meetings is very opaque. And so even though you had digital technology around how you conduct meetings, allowing remote work, you know, the Zooms, the Google Meets and so on, what actually, you know, what actually transpires in the meeting, the technology never knows. And humans have to then go after the meeting and update their tools, you know, update their teams, write up meeting minutes, all that, all that great stuff. And uh, we created Assembly AI to address that. Uh, we thought that an AI participant in the meeting could be very, very valuable. Got it. Was there a triggering meeting that made you say, hey, we need this right now? Because I might have just had one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I don't think there was one. I think uh, in many ways, like a lot of these, the, it's interesting because without having this as an option, it's hard to be mad at it as in when, you know, let's say when I was growing up, all we had were beepers and chains. This was before, uh, you know, the, the touch phones, uh, but no one was upset that they couldn't Instagram their food. Right. Like I wasn't like, I gosh, darn I Like, I wish I could photograph my breakfast. Like that was never a thought that crossed my mind, even though now that's like what we do every day. Um, so I think it's very similar. I think before uh, the advent of AI participants in meetings, you don't sit there going, you know what I really need in this meeting? Like what would really help my life is an AI participant. Like it never occurs to you. But once you know it's it's an option, all kinds of, you know, it's like, yeah, great. So maybe I don't have to come to this meeting. Maybe the AI can come instead of me and, you know, send me the notes, which is something our product does. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, question though. So... You have, let's say, an AI that comes in and replaces me because I had a meeting conflict. How do you balance having thorough notes with having concise notes? That's a really great question. So um, I think that there's there's an phases of, evolu of evolution in this environment happening. And initially, when uh, other companies in our area said they had meeting notes, they actually had no meeting notes. They had a transcript, but they called it meeting notes because why not? Um, then uh, AI approaches came along or machine learning approaches came along and uh, good summarizations became possible. But then it's a question of what is a good summarization? So to your point, like how detailed, how lightweight. And so uh, when we uh, build our uh, meeting notes, uh, feature set, which we call Glance, it was actually based on our experience in consulting. It was what are, what would I find useful and insightful um, in, uh, in meeting notes that I can actually look at, be fairly well informed as to what happened in the meeting, and then pass, you know, pass things along to other people if I need to. So it's actually pretty static and it's based on 
our expertise from this background. But moving forward, and this is where this technology is evolving today, it's you can understand. So there's a few um, kind of dials. One dial is what type of a meeting is it? Because depending on the type of meeting, the summary of the meeting and the blocks of the summary of the meeting could be different. You know, whether it's a stand up with a team or it's a, some kind of a client meeting or it's a, a town hall, uh, very different dials in terms of the type of a meeting. Um, the other dial is um, the, the detail. So in terms of summary and precision, like, uh, you know, how much do you want to include? And that often is a personal preference. And so um, the, our products are evolving into that category as well, where we can um, personalize and adjust. And then there's another step, which is personalized summary. So if I know who you are, meaning I know your role in the meeting, I know what your inputs in the meeting were, or not only were, I know what, based on your role, I know what your inputs in, in the meeting would tend to be or are expected to be, let's say. And I could also assess your takeaways. And then based on your role, I can give you a personalized summary for that meeting that really is impactful for you. So you can think, for instance, like in a standup again, you know, there's a, let's say there's a scrum master. If I know you're a scrum master, there's like certain kinds of participation you have in the meeting. If I know you're a team lead, it's something else. If I know you're a dev, it's things that are very specific to the things you're working on that you're interested in. So um, that level of customization is something that um, you can expect to see over the next year or so come into the fore. With your clients that have perhaps not the healthiest working environment, maybe they work for a really big company that there's some sort of existential threat looming over everybody's heads of, hey, if I say the wrong things in meetings and then there's this transcript of it, are people going to, to read that and be like, why did we hire this idiot? Or, hey, this person isn't being constructive. Do people change their behavior? Have you heard that from people knowing that there's this permanent record of, of what is said in meetings and do they adapt? Do they sort of get better at being in meetings because they know this is there? Um, I think initially there is a, it's a bit jarring. And when you first start to have AI participants in your meetings, I think you start to be very self-aware happened to our team. Like it's normal. You very quickly get used to it. <laughs> like today, if I'm in a meeting without, um, assembly agent on the call, I'm, it feels a little bit off because, and also a little bit nervous, like. I don't have this to refer back to. So I actually now am more comfortable on a call with an AI participant. And in terms of behavior, long term, so there's a short term behavior change that very quickly, I think, even out. It's kind of like an initial spike that even out. Um, long term, I think you, you, I don't think there's a major behavior change. I think it kind of cuts off, like, you know, I don't, I definitely wouldn't like go crazy or go off in the meeting because I know that the agent is there. Like, not that I, not that I do generally um, for the audience out there, but, uh, but it's something that I am aware of, like in terms of like extremes, but other than that, it never really crosses my mind. I just have my meetings as I go along. Um, so I, so I think that's kind of like the curve of, of behavior changes. Like there's a, there's a spike initially, the spike, draws out and then maybe like where you land is just a little bit of that kind of cutting off at the edges um, of behavior. Uh, Long-term people just forget and get super used to it. Interesting. I would think that the first shift that a team would have, if, if we're talking about, you know, customer, like a client service provider sort of discussion, which you were in consulting, you know, that's what Michael does full time. Uh, and I used to do that as well where you have those type of clients where it's just brass tacks. The only thing that they want to discuss is what are we doing? What's the status? What are the blockers? Let's get through this meeting as quickly as possible because we all hate doing these meetings and we just want to get through it. And then you can have one of those in the morning and you're like, all right, oh, geez, I got a two hour block meeting and man, this is going to eat up so much of my morning. And then after 27 minutes, you're like, wow, that was so efficient. That was awesome. We just got through everything. And the poor people that are taking notes are just furiously typing the entire time. And they, they miss probably 30, 40% of the critical details because you can only type and listen so much. But then 
we've all been in those meetings where it's like, all right, it's, it's a 45 minute meeting, you know, scheduled meeting. It's been four and a half hours and we've heard all about this guy's dog that had to go to the vet last week. And, you know, somebody asking a, completely irrelevant questions about some other project that we're not even meeting about. So it seems like it, a tool like this would focus people uh, in that sort of relationship uh, in a meeting where you're like, Hey, we have an agenda and we can see it in real time. Are we hitting all of the points? Are we getting summarizations? So that's pretty, pretty fascinating. Does it filter out small talk? So we've had a small talk filter in the product from like many years ago. Yeah. It's one of the <laughs> earliest things we built because yeah, we're, you know, as you're analyzing with ML, um, you know, the initial versions of these algorithms were very extractive and like a, cate a categorization based. Um, so for that, it was important to get rid of like the garbage, I mean, not the garbage, but like the, the non-productive conversation. In fact, we had, so there's the way, you know, our system worked is that there's a pre-process, including things like small talk removal. So we had models trained on small talk, on small talk and then remove that. But then we also had a part of the system that that actually part of the system is still alive. Uh, it's called Kodama, which is a uh, it identifies areas of conversation that are most ripe for producing insightful key items. Um, and you use things like you know different factors of conversation, like how much is this conversation about something that's happening in the future. So you're basically before this is like you know there's world before GPT and like after GPT. Um, so before GPT, you had to, let's say, help the models along. Basically, you had to first reverse engineer certain contextual things in the conversation and then only apply like the, you know, the, the, um, the discernment, like, oh, this is an action item. This is, um, this is changing very rapidly with the large language models of today because the large language models are very good at reading comprehension. So they understand when it's small talk and they understand when it's productive conversation all on their own. They don't need help. So they're actually very contextually rich when they analyze. And so they need fewer hints. Some hints still help, but they need um, much fewer hints to, uh, to, do, to, to get the job done. So, yes, so we, we used to remove small talk, um, but uh, these days it's le that's less of a, of a concern. Um, ben, to your point, so first of all, it sounds like very dry consultants of like, they just chop, 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 right? Like there's, it's important to have some human and like elements in your meetings. It creates, you know, that teaming and that kind of, that you enjoy working with the other people. So like just having it like to the point, I think would be probably bad. Like there's a little bit of, you need like a little bit of fat in your steak. I don't know if that's a great analogy, yeah. um, but, uh, but I think, I think it, it probably applies. Um, certainly, certainly. Um, you'll be able to see much better on how productive different meetings are in terms of next steps generated or productive next steps generated. And you can make some conclusions based on that. That 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 is already available. I don't think it's being tapped into really by organizations, but I think over the next couple of years, that's going to start to be a factor in um, in assessing like operational effectiveness. So a tech question for you. And if you don't want to give away the goods of how your, how stuff is implemented, that's fine. But out of just sheer curiosity, uh, so you have this large language model that's running through, well, you have, I'm sure you have a, a suite, a host of many models that are doing all of this stuff. Uh, I counted at least 11 so far in just what you've said of like, it's kind of how I think they would do it. it. Yeah, it's definitely way more than that. But you're processing audio, you know, Flack encoded audio or something, you convert that to an, an array, which gets converted into a tensor, goes into this model, and you're getting, you know, basically audio to, to text of the raw, like, here, here's everything that I heard. And then you're going to run that through summarization models, which are saying, take this raw big body of text and just say, what are the key important things? And as you said, GPT models are, GPT-2 is arguably okay at that i think if you really trained it well gpt3 is just leaps and bounds ahead of what that was 3.5 is even better and now four it's it's approaching magical territory in my opinion 
Um, and then I know they're working on five and they're probably working on GPT six right now. Um, but when we talk about these large language models and some of the, you know, deep implementations that can happen where you have, Hey, I have this pre-trained, extremely large model. It could be generative in nature. Uh, you know, all of these are, are built on the transformers architecture. So the concept of, Hey, I can create this processor unit. That's going to take in this massive body of text. That is sort of the raw data or the raw summarization. And then you can create a prompt that has stateful context associated with the user ID. Do you currently have that where, Hey, I, I want to listen, or I want to ask questions of this model system and ask this bot, like, Hey, what did, it, did people talk about this in this meeting and just be able to get this quick summarization, single you know, paragraph of text? Is that currently available or is that something that you're thinking about right now? So funny, you should ask. Um, it's a feature called Semblian and this feature is going live, believe it or not, tomorrow morning. Nice. <laughs> um, it's been something we've been working on for a while. Um, Saturday? Saturday? Well, the team has to deploy on the weekend to make sure everything is, you know, hunky dory. Got it. And Monday is when the, the customers come on. So, yeah, uh, we love our Saturday deploys. Uh, Saturday morning cartoons slash deploys. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's exactly what you described. Um, it's, uh, we call it ChatGPT for meetings. Um, you can go in and you could ask it um, basically any question about, the meeting that you have, you can say, you can, you know, you can ask like, what did this person say to that person? You could, um, have it make a poem out of a meeting, like everything you can imagine with chat GPT, this thing will do. Uh, we have, you know, a lot of, uh, kind of secret sauce around, uh, making it effective and appropriate for the meeting context. Um, there's some both, uh, like conceptual challenges and also still technical challenges around that. Um, because you can't just feed a meeting to uh, to GPT and like get a response back. It's like there's all kinds of different weird limitations around. Um, but uh, yeah, this is uh, this is exactly it. So you can talk, you can talk to your assembly and about anything in the meeting and and have it respond. Everything from summaries. The craziest thing. This is the thing that blew me away, and it's I've seen it blown other people away too. Is that um, it's multilingual. So. Mm -hmm. You can have it, you can ask it a question in any language. You can have it, like, quote unquote, any, like almost any, right? All the popular ones. And you can ask it for a response in any language, mm -hmm. no matter what language the meeting was in. Yeah, it's fascinating. So, what about stuff that f for our previous, you know, work and Michael's current work, when we're talking about, hey, we're providing advice and, you know, consulting to a, a customer and, even outside of the, you know, business consulting or SAF, SAS in, uh, industry, visualizations are a key part of summarizing a meeting. And GPT-4, you know, one of the things that it's, you know, just released, it was two weeks ago or last week, whenever it dropped, I was like, hey, you can pass, you know, you can use mixed modal uh, approaches with this. We're like, hey, you can pass it an image and tell it to create something new out of that or describe things in it. So these multimodal models, uh, is that something that's on the horizon too? And how far off do you think that is where you can ask it a question and say, Hey, can you just generate some architecture diagrams for me that, of what we just described? Or, Hey, I need to do an executive report on this next week. Can you create a bunch of PowerPoint sides? about this five hour long meeting? Yeah, I think, um, so uh, there's this term going around this Cambrian explosion of startups in the in the environment. And I think it's very accurate um, because what these large language models now provide, um, so, you know, GPT-4 is the darling of the hour, of course, but um, BARD is coming around and um, uh, there's there's going to be others. Uh, there's some open source ones that we've been seeing starting to come together. So it's, it's very exciting. It's sort of maybe in some way like the mature OS space or something like that are, mm -hmm. but these large, large language models, um, 
uh, provide this kind of crude, uh, like crude oil effectively. Um, but you can't just pour crude oil into your Toyota, right? So somebody needs to refine it to a certain kind of a fuel, whether it's like gasoline or diesel or kerosene or whatever is used. Um, so, so these large language models are this crude oil and then there are refiners. So assembly, uh, AI is a kind of a refiner for, for, um, large language models in addition to a bunch of other things, um, that provides a certain business value outcome. And so you're going to see all you're, you're definitely going to see, um, within the next probably year, definitely within two years, what you just described, like based on this meeting, like generate architectural diagrams. Um, but it'll probably be like things that are more specialized in that because you do need to put some guardrails and put some kind of common sense structures around what it produces. You can just, it's not, um, the problem is always context. And so as brilliant as large language models are, like they don't know, you know, like they, they only know what they see in the immediate, but they don't know the background. Like they don't know kind of your personality or who I am or like things about the background of, um, of the company, <clears throat> they know what they can see and then kind of leverage that against all their training. So you, you need to, uh, usually kind of give them the additional context and then guidance to, to get to an accurate business result. I think the accurate business result is the, is the hard thing because it's easy to dolly yourself into a new image, right? It's like, oh, okay, draw me a robot. Okay, that looks like a robot success. But like identify a task that is an actual real task that needs to be done and assigned to a person by a particular date and like figure out what that date should be. Like that's actually really, really hard like to, to get it narrow into, into a business value point. So, but that's, that's happening. Um, and that's going to happen both in visualization and mixed modal and in text and in all sorts of other areas. We focus right now, we, we don't do anything visual today. Uh, we don't have that on the roadmap. We're very focused on understanding the conversation and then providing value out of the conversation. But I don't exclude it. I think maybe in the future that that could be a turn that we take um, because we find it so valuable. I think your last paragraph of speech just now is probably the most relevant advice that anybody could give to people that are listening to this hype because you guys have been doing this for years and anybody that's been you know if we if we go back in time eight nine years ago when the initial well it's not initial i think it's the fourth generation of hype around deep learning or like neural networks you know the first one was back in the 60s and then it got super exciting in the 1980s and people were like wait a minute these are really hard um but back you know pre I don't remember what version of TensorFlow. I think it was pre, like pre 1.0 when it came out. Everybody's like, this is going to be revolutionary and it's going to do all the things. And they put some image models out there, uh, pre-trained ones. You could start using CNNs and uh, everybody got really excited. And a lot of people sunk a lot of time and money into trying to get those things to work. <clears throat> but then everybody realized that, hey, they don't do everything. They do a lot of things like, hey, the CNN can classify what it sees in bounding boxes that it detects as important characteristics in, in images. But how do you make a product out of that? And that what you were talking about, that focus on this one thing and realize that the model is a component. Definitely, it's a very important component. But most of the work is all of that ancillary work. And that's what really makes the product is like, how are you controlling the input data? How are you massaging the outputs? How are you doing safe fallbacks? How are you doing filtering when you're talking about language outputs? Because the raw output of some of these things, uh, I was a couple of weeks ago uh, working with an old GPT-2 pre-trained model. I was like, hey, I, I just want to see if I start, you know, if I train it on some you know, fine training on some potentially bogus data. I just downloaded Twitter data and had it learn on that and then started asking it, you know, some sequence classification of passing in just random stuff that I was typing. It's like, ooh, it's it's reporting stuff that there's no way you would send this to a customer. If you had this thing, the raw output out there, you know, 
as something that general people could interact with, this thing is bad, like potentially super offensive uh, about what it, what it inferred from this sentence um, or like the emotional uh, classification ones where training that on some, you know, overly antagonistic Twitter data, uh, it starts classifying everything as like stuff that most people would find pretty offensive. It's like classifying it as happy. It's like, what? So yeah, that, that output, like how you handle the output coming out of that is the most critical thing. And I think you summarized it perfectly. Like, Hey, we, we focus on doing this one thing really well. And, and, you know, based on your demo that I, that I looked at and, uh, your website, it seems like you do an exceptional job at this. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, so I mean, listeners, if you want to know how to how to monetize this awesome stuff, like that's that's the secret sauce right there. Is focus on that problem and and pay attention to the details. The, it's interesting. We just had, I guess, a month or two ago, we had a company kickoff for Databricks. Um, and for those who don't know, Ben and I work there, and <laughs> Ben was smart enough to not show up, and. Um, it was really interesting to see how the company prioritizes. So if you go back to Facebook in 2008, the only metric that they cared, or pre-2008, I guess, the only metric that they cared about was the number of users. They didn't care about retention. They didn't care about uh, if users were interacting with the platform or anything like that. It was just the growth numbers. And Databricks has a sort of a similar prioritization strategy where it's not about growth, but it's about very specific initiatives and it lets other seemingly important initiatives just not fall apart, but there's no active development in them. And I think that's one of the hardest things as a business leader is to figure out what to prioritize and what to sacrifice. Because you can't put all of your eggs in every single basket. You have to pick baskets. So um, I was wondering, Artem, what eggs or what baskets are you putting your eggs in for assembly? Yeah, so I, um, we've... We we uh, we had this classical like startup challenge where you kind of you 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 grow this bouquet of features in your product and then you find out that you know that's not what brings the users uh, to the to the platform. So we're we're a lot more selective these days. Um, uh, our roadmap is focused right now on. Uh, on a few things. So um, this this new so one one thing is that we we do want to bring users and we want to create attention. One of the challenges that GPT brought is that it it lowered the differentiation barrier by a lot. So we used to have a very differentiated technology. It was very difficult for others to compete um, in the analytics aspect of our product. Um, and today it's a lot more accessible. So, you know, anyone can leverage a large language model and generate a summary. So we want to make sure that we're maximizing what we get out of uh, large language models and um, are introducing things like Semblian um, to really kind of maximize the, that, that value in the product and, and create interest in a customer. And the other thing um, that we're doing is we're actually paying a lot of attention to retention and churn, and we want to... Um, make the make the product very self understood like um kind of intuitively understood um and also nudge the user towards different areas without complicating the interface so we're actually investing a lot in simplicity and also guiding the user into into how things work because remember this is such a new space this is a category that effectively didn't exist until just a few years ago um, and realistically didn't exist until maybe a year ago uh, because people just weren't thinking in these dimensions. COVID-19 was a big accelerator for this space. Um, and now the AI technology is another big accelerator for this space. So uh, helping the user along um, in terms of what this product does and, and how to maximize its use is also very, very important. Um, then there's... Um, we're, we're looking at some long-term roadmaps in terms of um, hitting functionality that you just can't get out of large language models. Like it's, that's, you know, so what are large language models are good at, you know, generating creative content. Um, they can be good at categorizing certain things. 
Um, but there are certain business problems that require a lot of finesse that just these large language models cannot do. Um, that require like some additional metadata from around the environment, require some understanding of like how uh, roles and things are structured. And so we're working on, on features that um, would really impact working teams that are not, um, that you can't just get out of the box with something like GPT. So like tasks is one of those things. Um, uh, we're, we're aiming to have the, the best system for um, understanding team tasks and being able to plop them directly into your task management environment. So you finish the meeting, and your your you know your Trello boards or whatever you use to manage tests is like pre-populated with the right content. It's actually a really really hard problem to solve. Just think about you know the team meets and says okay like yeah I want you to do this next week. Like what does this mean, right? So and that's just one little element of of the complexity of this problem. So so those are so near term we're we're throwing in exciting things like Semblian, which are really really cool and have all sorts of business value. We're um, softening that with um, functionality to, to help users use these new kinds of AI and empower tools because they're so new. And long term, we're looking at some of these like very difficult, technically and conceptually difficult landings like tasks. So that's almost similar to what GitHub Copilot Plus, I guess, just released uh, based on ChatGPT4. I guess they did that news release yesterday or something um, <clears throat> where now you can do with GitHub Copilot, not only is it using the advanced, much larger GPT-4 framework, but they turned on the ability to do uh, basically speech to text for code development. And you can even explain it an abstract concept like, Hey, can you, I, I need to open, like basically write a function that, that opens and, and converts an image into JPEG format. Okay. It writes the function for that. You're like, Hey, can you add four unit tests? I want to see if you can load in, you know, byte array data, NumPy array, you know, byte encoded string and a bitmap image for fun. Writes those four unit tests for you in the appropriate test uh, structure. And then you say, okay, I need to interface with, you know, this transformers model that uh, is of this architecture. Can you go, you know, write a function that fetches that? And it just starts writing the code. It's not perfect. You know, a senior experienced developer is going to look at the code generated and be like, eh, that's not how I would write that. But you can prompt it via, via voice. And that seems like that naturally fits into what you've already been doing, where you're like, hey, listen to this, these meeting minutes is a natural extension of that developer productivity tools or PM productivity tools where you can interface with certain partnered ecosystems where you're like, hey, I want to plug in for Jira so that when I say, hey, create a story that does these things and it just starts transcribing the summarization in a particular style that you've trained it in. It, stuff like that, that seems like it's in your wheelhouse big time. Yeah, that's that's kind of the problem because a lot of things are in our wheelhouse. Um, that was a big, so maybe, you know, last year at some point we were thinking about different directions and that was, that was actually the major problem. There was like so many cool things we can do. Uh, from, you know, specializing, customizing, specializing, like summarizations around roles to creating specialized applications for like a scrum, like a, what would a scrum master want to get out of a meeting? And then like maybe some even like tool or some coaching, blah, 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 like some automation, like around a specific role. Um, yeah, I think we have a very cool voice AI platform, which allows us to do these things, which, which just means that we can engage with your meeting environment very uh, fluidly. Like we can participate in all of your different conference call systems. We sync with your calendar. We understand like, you know, schedule complexity. We can also listen in the microphones. Like, um, so we, we, we have a, a very effective way to participate in the environment and also then turn the audio into really good text diarized by who said what. And that's also a special kind of a thing. Like we have a partnership with uh, Philips um, that currently have a, uh, one of their product lines is smart meeting, which is like a series of these conference call microphones. And we're 
one of the special things about assembly is we support hybrid environments very well. So we're not just online. Like if some of the people are a microphone in a room and some are online, like we'll support that environment as well. Um, so, um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's just a lot, there's a lot that you can do. Um, and it's the, I think the biggest challenge is like figuring out what not to get involved. And I think, uh, next year, um, you know, this year, I think we're pretty much spoken for, like we know where we want to go, but next year there could be more platformed aspects for our technology where we could maybe have plugins for more specialized, um, kind of functions for these different um, different kinds of use cases, uh, but we're trying very hard not to jump on all of the all of those um, really cool like candies of, of business propositions. Uh, it is pretty cool. I, I did want to say that like for the co-pilot thing, exactly what you mentioned. Like, I think it's like a very powerful, magical um, like you know um, staff that can do like wield a lot of magic, but in the hands of a junior. Oh yeah. Like, Dangerous. Right. And, and this also raises a question. Okay. So the juniors, the juniors will use this tool to like write a lot of code. And then what happens? It goes up for code review to the lead. But does this mean now like the lead is just going to be like swamped with garbage code? Like, so we have to think about these kinds of things, right? Because um, as good as, as good as these tools are they're they still make a lot of mistakes, especially in, in like writing, you know, like writing actual good source, like, actual programming, um, they can give you good things, um, like good directional things, almost like kind of template-y, but very often it will be either not working code or like, or buggy in some weird way, unless you know what the thing is supposed to look like. Um, I think you might, you know, you might cause more trouble than it's, than it's worth and not learn. Like that's another thing, right? Like how will you learn? to be a lead from that type of technology. So it brings all sorts of like new and interesting uh, questions and dynamics and like um, in roles, like what are roles now um, are going to do? Like, you know, the, the, will the leads now have like all, all this work on top of them because they're getting much more um, like pr issue prone code because of GPT. Yeah. One of my favorite, because I'm doing, I'm writing an interface for, you know, these sorts of things right now at Databricks and uh, there's a lot of testing that I have to do and just keeping up to speed with all of the, you know, these massive developments that keep on happening. Uh, you know, the 6 a.m. the morning that after GPT-4 announced, I was just on there, like not doing what other people were probably doing. I mean, I mean there's, of course, other people who are doing what I was doing, but I'm not having it, you know, write a blog post for me or tell me a joke or, you know, write a song for me. I'm more like, Hey, can you give me the most efficient implementation of the Fibonacci sequence in these five languages? And then going to each one of them and saying, tell me what the computational complexity is of that. And I want you to make it, you know, from O log N, I want you to make an O N squared implementation for me. And then seeing how, if it could do that, if it could write bad code effectively, and then saying, Hey, what's the worst computational complexity that you can create for solving this problem and seeing what it was generating and then having it regenerate other iterations of it. And it's, it's a little bit, it's not really reverse engineering how the, the generative model works. Cause good luck with that. It's more just seeing how would people actually use this from a development perspective. And then other times when <clears throat> exactly, as you said, like, a senior person, these tools are very useful because sometimes you're trying to move really quick and you're, you're not really thinking about all of the aspects of different ways to approach this one function or this one, I don't really use it for function generation, but unit tests, I love using it for unit tests. I'm like, Hey, here's a function. Can you write seven different unit tests for me? And I just want to see what it, what it's analyzing about my code. And what are the seven different things that it it's trying to, it's basically pen testing my code. So then I say, oh, these four are really good. These three really suck. But out of those four, one of those things I didn't even think of to test. That's really clever. It, it, it doesn't work. Like it doesn't like execute correctly, but it gives me that idea of like, oh, I need to test this part of it because it saw this in the code. 
So that aspect of it in the hands of a senior, like a, a really senior developer is super powerful. But yeah, it, on all the testing that I've done, even for the new iterations, I'd say it's like 40% of the time marginally correct on generating something that I wouldn't be upset with doing a PR over. Uh, the other 60% is like, yeah, that just doesn't work. Or it's so, it's so bad that either performance wise or security wise that it would be a danger to put into any sort of library. People are going to do it though. Uh, exactly. Exactly. But see, you, you see it and you know, okay, this one is interesting. These three are crap. Um, a more junior dev is going to be like, here's my seven unit tests. You know, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, I think programming is probably one of the more difficult, um, problems that is going to, um, is going to be solved by, uh, generative AI just because there's, um, until AI starts to understand like enough about the full project scope, yep. you know, it's not just like point, like a write me this, you know, like a function that does the sort in like whatever order and squared or if you, whatever you want. Right. But, like a function that you can write, but like write something in context of the project. Mm -hmm. That's really hard. Yeah. You look at some of the open source packages that are out there that are on GitHub that this thing, these things were trained on, uh, for GPT 3.5 and, and four. If you ask it like, Hey, can you, I want a feature that, that exposes this new rest API endpoint for this open source package. There's no way it's going to know what files to change, how to look through and and understand the levels of abstraction. If it's a professional open source, you know, package that's really well done by professional engineers, <clears throat> even sometimes even senior engineers are like, I have no idea how I'm going to solve this. Like I have to reverse engineer how this was implemented. It's going to take me a day reading through the code to figure out like, how do I want to implement this while fitting within this abstraction model? And I have tested it, uh, like taking a couple of open source packages that are written in, you know, mostly a functional uh, paradigm and then some in pretty much an exclusively object oriented paradigm. And it, it does a little bit better on the functional provided that you give it all of the required functions in that, that dependency chain, but still doesn't really quite grok what it needs to do when you have too much complexity in there. But the object oriented stuff it, with extreme levels of abstraction, it just generates garbage, comical garbage. Sometimes you're like, why, why would you think that that would work? And then you tell it like, Hey, you're really far off base here. And then the fun thing for me to do is to see how far down the hallucination chain it can go before it's like, I give up. I don't know how to answer you. It's like basically writing a whole new programming language by the time I'm, I'm breaking it in that way. But yeah, to your point, like a junior dev wouldn't know that. It's like, oh, I ran this. It didn't work. It's going to generate some even deeper, crazy garbage on the next iteration. And you're like, oh, here's the exception I just got. Okay, go even further down the crazy hole. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting parallels uh, between the timelines for assembly and sort of chat GPT. So if you think about meeting notes in general, we had transcription 10, 15 years ago. It might've not been amazing, but it would work. You would have every single word from your recorded audio in a Google doc or wherever it is. What assembly is currently doing is they're trying to extract sort of action items and uh, sort of the low hanging fruit. But what I think the holy grail of artificial intelligence in general is it looks to identify things that humans can. So, <laughs> For, for instance, business risks and uh, things of that nature, like uh, business opportunities is another great example. Like if we don't implement this feature, we will lose this amount of money. And I think that there are two components that lead into that feature, which is you have to have organizational context and train on how the organization runs, industry, competitors, that type of thing. But you also need an algorithm that can think critically 
and distill information and then make logical and maybe even creative jumps. So question for both Ben and Artem, how would we go about making that step from where we currently are in both AI and in meeting summarization? How do we go from this current step into the holy grail of it can do what a thought leader at a business does? Ben, you have ideas? I, I mean, I'm happy to, I'm happy to, to say and then, um, what we were thinking, because it's something we thought about uh, before. Uh, I think it's kind of, it's a phase of evolution. So yeah. uh, it's something we call enterprise awareness. There's other names for it, but effectively one way to think about what's going on is so now that you have AI participants in the environment that really know what's going on with the team and they can go, they can know what's going on with all of the teams. What's happening is you're creating this like digital trail of all of the content that, and all of the discussions that are happening. Um, so you can imagine that, you know, each kind of work group of teams has kind of a little brain that that knows what that team what those teams are up to in that work group. Right? So like think of it like a chat GPT, but like in the work group that really can answer questions really well about the activity across those teams. Now that little guy um, can talk to another agent in another work group and they can communicate. And so you can have this uh, t like this tiered hierarchical structure where the entire enterprise becomes like this sense like this neural net type of a sensory organ that is plugged into everything that's going on in a very digital way and so um i think that's the that is a holy grail for enterprise ai where there's ai involved across all team activities everywhere that can commute and create these nodes of awareness in those activities and those nodes can communicate to each other it's very brainy in the way right though they can communicate to each other so for instance for instance let's say you you have the marketing team and like or a marketing department and they have like this little node and the node knows that you know there's a, a project that the marketing team is about like needs to start working on and creating like a PR, whatever, rollout. Well, it knows that that PR rollout depends on like a certain feature set that's coming out. So it can actually talk to the node in development and say, hey, how's that project doing? Like, is it likely that it's coming on time? Like how confident are you? Is the, are the dates good? And have that up-to-date information and then, then help the marketing team do their planning for that. Or like, you know, is there a spec change? Like has, you know, is everything approved? Da -da -da -da. Right. So these nodes can actually like interact among themselves. And then if they're missing information like that node in dev can talk to the team and say, hey, marketing, you know, like need some more info. Like, how are you guys? So it becomes this very futuristic kind of a system. And all of that can integrate into this sort of a and then AI that can support enterprise level decision making. So it really creates these digital tentacles all through the organization that um, kind of in, you know, not in, not in real time necessarily, but in like near real time can um, aggregate the data up and um, help the company understand like where things are moving in a very, like, in a very, you know, like not to overuse it, like in a very intelligent way, right? Because that aggregate node can then ask the higher level questions, like of all the activity that's happening across the, our operations, what metrics, what key metrics are we impacting this month, this quarter, this half a year, this year? Like, what is the impact? Like predictive impact to all of the activities that are going on. You give that information to management, management takes it. Okay. Like I see. So we're not, you know, we're not doing enough to reduce churn or we're not doing enough to capture this market share. And then that can flow back down um, into, into the organization. Wait, so you're going to be digitizing organizational structure where each node corresponds to a role in an organization. So you have the product manager role, the software engineer role, and then the CEO node that listens to each of them. It's not a one for one. Think about the fact that we already have AI participants in meetings and that AI participant knows 
like for that team, basically everything that they're doing, right? So it's already like following you. It's following Michael along to your meetings. It like, it, it hears what you have to say, what your coworkers have to say. Like it knows what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, in not too long, uh, not into too distant future, it's also going to aggregate your collaboration material, like what you're doing on Slack or Microsoft Teams. Um, so it's, it's pretty well up to speed on like everything that's going on and it can assess it and it can also be predictive about the outcomes. So now you have this, this node that's, that has awareness of the, what the local team does. You can expand that, expand that to a local work group. Those can interact and then you can expect that, expand that to, or raise that to, um, you know, a, a division, then raise that to the corporate, global, whatever have you. So it's not a, you're not like putting an AI next to, next to each one of the humans. You just have AIs as team members, but because they are AI team members, they don't forget. <laughs> they can analyze constantly. They don't need to sleep. They can instantly exchange information. So they're a bit superhuman in a way. And if they get smart enough, they can start to be very, um, very contributing um, to the organization. I was going to say something similar to that, but I don't know, maybe I'm an optimist thinking in the future of like maybe 30 years after that is sort of a suite of of AI that would be customized to each individual employee as well. That would be conversational in the, in the effect that it can actually pose and notify and respond to theoretical uh, sort of questions that somebody would have. Cause it, you know, we've all been assigned projects in whatever industry that we work in that we're like, is this really how I should be spending my time? Is this the best thing for the company? And nobody's going to, I mean, some people do at all hands meetings, raise their hand, ask some E staff member, you know, CEO or COO or like, Hey, is this really the direction that we want our company to be going? And usually the response is, yeah, uh, that's why we made the decision. You don't have all of the context here, but to have that sort of, that sort of buddy, uh, along with you, whether it, wherever it's embedded in, uh, in your day-to-day -day operations as something that you can actually speak to or type questions to or whatever. Say like, Hey, can you make sure that I'm not overextended on my project work? Like, Hey, I have everything that's assigned to me. I scoped it. I guessed that this was going to take me a week to do this and two weeks to do that and have that AI assistant say, Hey, Ben, uh, based on your previous execution on similar things, yeah, that's not happening, dude. Like, did you forget that you need to do this level of testing for this? This implementation doesn't just, it's not self-contained code. You need to do integration testing with these other different systems within the, the platform. And last time you, that you guys messed with that, it took three weeks to do. So I'm going to go ahead and update uh, for you, if you accept this, that I'm going to tack on an additional three weeks of work I'm going to notify people in Slack for you. I'm going to notify their bots. And I'm also going to update all of our tracking software that's going to say, this is when we're going to be done with this. And I'll notify this team and this other team that this is going to be delayed by three weeks. And having that sort of like bolting on to everything that you said, I think that's the next evolution, definitely, is that sort of team focused uh, interaction. But I also think that having a confidential personal assistant that's not going to be phoning home, uh, that's just going to like got your back. You can ask it anything like, Hey, uh, am I going to like totally screw up here? If I, if I take this project on and the AI says like, yeah, maybe move, like wait for something else or it's listening in on the conversation. Like, Hey, here's our quarterly projects that we got. Uh, Everybody let us know what you want to work on. And if you're like, oh, these three things sound really cool. And then have the AI bot be like, bro, no, <laughs> just take two of them. Let somebody else take that other one and you'll, you'll have a good quarter. Uh, yeah, I think something like that would be awesome. I think that's a really interesting idea. Like the split between like what's a corporate AI versus a personalized AI. And I think very, very relevant. Um, 
it's that it's a it's a tough challenge because how do you expose a personal AI to the corporate information without you know without risking like um, it talking to things and also like can you trust it can you trust your personal AI with talking to so so there's a lot of questions like that um, I think a really interesting uh, example is like yeah you know why are we working on this project now that like literally happened to me this week. Um, you know, one of my leads connected, he's like, Hey, like the team, we have been doing so many re-architectures so quickly. Well, obviously GPT is here and like, you know, are we doing the right thing? Why are we so, so would be really, really helpful to have something like that. that can answer those questions. I think we're pretty far away from that because it's very sensitive, that information, but in terms of like, what should I be working on? I think, I think that's like a lot closer than you think. So like we have this feature in assembly that. Uh, listens for your, what we call commitments. Like when you say you were going to do something, uh, effectively to do's, but like, we don't want to like part of the reason we didn't want to call it a to do's is because effectively what we're doing there is creating a list of what you're supposed to be working on. And, um, this is very, very close to an AI telling you what to do. Very, very close. So in, in our case, it's, we hope it's fairly innocuous because it's things you said yourself. And you've committed to, and we're not saying it's your to-dos, like they're your commitments, whether you want to make them your to-dos is your, your choice, but you know, you can actually already, uh, connect that up to your to-do app. And so, uh, you have your meetings during the week and Monday you come in your, your Microsoft to-do app is pre-filled with to-do activities based on what you committed to during the week. That's possible today. Um, and this is like level, you know, this is level one. <laughs> now, like imagine what level 50 looks like, right? Like, because there's all these things now you can like make sense of these tasks. You can prioritize them. You can have the corporate AI. Pri I mean, it gets crazy. So we're getting into that territory and it's a, uh, it's a little bit of a, you know, interesting and contentious territory of how much, you know, how much of to do's AI can give you in fact, effectively, um, um, uh, basically, um, I'm, I'm, there's like a really good word for this, marshalling, marshalling <laughs> the resource uh, towards a goal uh, without human input, more or less. And then the next generation after that is being able to detect which of those tasks another AI bot could just autonomously do. You know, you look at a, a dev's <clears throat> task list for a particular sprint, it, you know, maybe 30% of that is develop this new feature that doesn't exist. There's no reference for it anywhere. It's never been built before. So, you know, maybe a generative AI could, you know, many decades from now, just figure that out from abstract explanation of something. We're definitely not there right now, but another 20% might be, Hey, you need to write some examples for code that you already wrote that need to, you know, go on the website or, Hey, we need just docs written for, yeah, remember all that code you wrote last sprint? Yeah. You know, 40% of the, the methods weren't, weren't documented properly. So could you build out all of the, like a full doc of that right now, chat GPT 3.5 or four, they're fantastic at writing, you know, docs in, I've tested it in seven different languages. I'm like, wow, they, it got, the, I mean, the syntax is easy to do, you know, just look up a reference for that, but the stylistic guidelines that adhere to generally accepted standards for different languages, it nails it. And it, it's, I haven't used it yet for an actual like ticket in a sprint, but I can't say I won't in the future. Uh, Cause it is pretty good. Uh, and that next generation of saying like, Hey, do you want me to do this for you? Cause you have better things to do. Like go figure out this complex feature. That's the part of these, you know, the application of this for my own personal, you know, selfishness. I really want to see these things get, you know, even better at sort of that, that team assistant that can raise its hand, it's, it's virtual hand and say, Hey, I got this. Can I do it? Or can I at least make an attempt and then you can check my work. And I think that sort of activity is. It's the same as if you're a new person coming into a team. How do you win the hearts and minds of your team members? You volunteer for stuff that they either don't have time to do or don't want to do. 
um, you're super humble, you're open to criticism and feedback. It's this, you know, employee 101 right there. It's like how you do it, how do you get accepted by a new team? And if AI models are behaving in a way that a really great new team member behaves as a human would, I think people will start anthropomorphizing them a bit and saying, we can't work without this bot. Like, the, you know, you'll start seeing people with emotional connections to this thing. Cause it's like, Hey, this thing had my back and it did all this work for me. It was great. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that day. For sure. Yeah. And, and it's not just code, right? Like a marketing meeting, um, or an HR meeting, like, Hey, we're talking about launching this new website. By the end of the meeting, you have five versions of the website waiting for you. You know, I, I, you know, I like the bot is, you know, we'll say like, oh, okay, I heard you're trying to do this new website. Like here's, you know, here's in this, here's in this style, here's in that style, here's a style based on the current site, blah, blah, blah. Like which style do you like? So you can actually pre-generate a lot of things based on the discussion, offload that from the team. So, yeah. Yeah. We're coming up on time and we didn't even get through one third of my notes that I had, um, <laughs> but unfortunately we don't have unlimited limited podcast time. So uh, I'm going to summarize and uh, we're going to wrap for our time as well. So um, some of the cool things that I heard in this podcast is the system that Assembly AI is leveraging. Uh, they have a bunch of different models and they used to have a small talk removal model, but that's less of a concern now. Um, and one of the core features that they leverage is sort of getting clever with extraction to classify types of conversation. So Thinking about tenses of verbs, for instance, if you're in the future tense, it's probably something that requires a to-do list or is theoretical. And if it's in the present tense, probably not. Um, and then they're also working on getting chat GPT based interactions to be fully integrated with this knowledge graph that is created through all the meetings. Um, some startup tenets that they follow are simplicity and intuitiveness. I think that's generally a, a good practice. No one likes complex anythings. And then they're also focusing specifically on team tasks. So how to plan a project and how to get that project plan into your favorite Jira software or whatever it may be. And then from a sort of a holy grail perspective, it seems like one path forward at least is to develop a organizational context knowledge graph. And this can be referenced by LLMs that use logic or any other service. And those can then be leveraged to make smart business decisions that are specific to your use case. And then finally, Ben had some advice. When you're joining a company, do all the stuff that people don't want to do. They'll like you for it. So Artem, if people want to learn more about Assembly AI or your work, where should they go? www.assembly.ai. That's S-E-M-B-L-Y. Uh, on the website, there's a free plan. There's also a free trial for the professional version. Uh, give it a whirl. By the time this podcast airs, Assemblyon will be live. Um, and uh, it's really fascinating um, the kind of uh, value you can get from everything from writing a next steps email for you based on the meeting to doing something fun with it, like, you know, uh, extol the virtues of all the participants of the meeting as heroes in a, in a, in a story in a storybook. So uh, that's um, that's on the product. Um, for me, I'm on LinkedIn, Artem Koren, uh, A-R-T-E-M-K-O-R-E-N. Um, you can find me there. And uh, it was really great talking to you guys. Really interesting conversation. Until next time, it's been Michael Burke and my co-host. Ben Wilson. And have a good day, everyone. See you next time.